arriving for the first time. Uh, my name is uh, Michael Good. I'm an associate professor of history in the Department of History and Political Science. I'm also on the executive committee for the Peace and Justice Studies program. It is my uh, distinct honor to welcome our next panelist for this uh, session, uh, Ray Critzy. Ray Critzy is a dispute resolution specialist working in the upper Midwest. She's the founder of Caldera Dialogue and Consulting Services, where she supports the development of conflict engagement programs, change management, grievance processes, and community dialogue. Ray teaches mediation, arbitration, and negotiation, and coached Loyola's students in the VIS Moot International Commercial Arbitration Competition for many years. Uh, she was the programs director at the Center for Conflict Resolution in Chicago, uh, for 10 years and has been part of the organization since 2010 as a volunteer and case manager. Ray is a certified mediator of civil, criminal, elder, and family disputes and a certified mediation trainer. She also facilitates community forums and has organized nonprofits and LLCs through consensus building. Uh, I consider her a good friend, a fellow Chicagoan, um, and a fellow traveler in the peace building uh, process. So without further ado, please welcome Ray Caritzi. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm on mic, right? Yeah, uh, there it is. There it is. All right. Well, I'm really excited to be with you here today. And um, I want to talk really specifically about this idea of what it means to be a mediator or a professional neutral um, when things don't feel very neutral. Right? So I'm, I have a, a few things I want us to get to talk about today, but I do want to give you just a little bit of a content notice. I'm going to tell you a few stories about myself, my practice, and people that I've worked with, and a few things that are going to come up in that storytelling is the death of a parent, the idea of challenging co-parents, and policing and police violence in the United States. Um, I like to put a little citations page at the front end. These are the things, things I think. I think I'm probably going to end up talking about when people's questions go and what happens. I've got a plan, but anything could happen here. Um, I had the, the privilege of being taught by Worsham Al at Lotus Trauma Care in Chicago, which gave me an excellent framework for talking about what trauma-led care might look like. Um, Professor Jim Wright, apologies if I'm mispronouncing that, I've never heard his name said out loud, um, has a concept on healing-centered engagement that I want to talk to you about that I really love as an evolution of what it means to create good spaces. Um, and then I do have up here on this slide both Sarah and Carl who are presenting today because we just talk about this stuff all the time together and um, their inspiration deserves credit for me. A friend and colleague of mine, Kim Moran, who is an, uh, an LCSW and um, a mediator who has also helped inspire a lot of my work. And then a colleague and mediator, Dan Burstein, who's a mental health expert um, who has really helped me be very intentional about the vocabulary that I use when I talk about my work. My plan today is to talk to you about becoming a mediator and what that path looked like for me. A lot of times people are like, how do you do this? You don't just get that job. It's not a job. Um, most of the time when you're responding to a job posting for a mediator, people think it's a meditator. <laughs> I get a lot of that response. Um, I want to talk about challenges that I faced to the idea of being a neutral when I was a mediator, and then how that also showed up for me in a really big community facilitation pro project that I had in 2020. And then I want to talk about some future considerations and what this looks like for the practice and then for peace builders of all kinds, this notion of neutrality. Uh, so Michael sort of told you this, but I want to tell you in a little bit more detail. So I currently have my own consulting practice. So I'm working right now with the National Center for State Courts to help build eviction diversion initiatives all over the United States. Um, I work with agencies and individuals to help manage and resolve conflicts in a lot of different ways. But for many years, I worked for Chicago's Community Mediation Center, the Center for Conflict Resolution. And at CCR, I was the programs director, which means I oversaw oh, about 22 mediation programs that served all of Chicago and Cook County. Um, and I did that before a global pandemic, through a global pandemic, and after a global, after a global pandemic, which truly feel like three different jobs. Uh, inside that work, one of the things 
I, I got to be part of designing and implementing a lot of different types of programs, mediation programs, methods, and models, and worked with a lot of different agencies to create mediation programs that were going to serve their communities. I got a JD from Loyola University Chicago School of Law, which was actually part of the path that brought me to mediation. Um, and I teach or have taught the courses that are listed there. So in alternative dispute resolution, which I teach every semester, we study negotiation, mediation, arbitration, and restorative justice concepts. And so I really love teaching people who plan to be attorneys because it's a course that sort of pulls them outside of everything else that we're teaching them about becoming a lawyer or becoming an advocate. And instead it says, leave all of your talent for problem solving behind. And instead, I'd like you to make space for other people to solve their own problems. Uh, like most people, I came to the world of mediation through women's flat track roller derby. Um, so I played roller derby in the early 2000s in Madison, Wisconsin. If you're not familiar with the modern roller derby movement, it started in 2003 in Austin, Texas. And roller derby leagues are community-based organizations. Almost everyone who plays the sport, makes the sport happen, sells t-shirts, takes tickets, refs the games, is a volunteer skater or a volunteer staff member. I do have to note that the, the universe of roller derby has evolved in the 20 years since I was playing, but um, these, these tenants are still really central to what roller derby looks like. Most roller derby leagues operate as LLCs or nonprofits with a community give back initiative. So some percentage of tickets and um, we would do sort of uh, community based events, clean, cleaned up the side of a highway, things like that. Um, and we had to create our own rules for how to play the game, which looked like a statue, right? Like section 12B, elbows may not be higher than the shoulder, you know, like li really, really specific rules. And so when I joined Roller Derby, the league that I joined was in its third year, um, which is pretty young for an organization of this kind. And I went to a rules and play committee meeting on a Wednesday night, and we fought for three hours in a coffee shop. And it was horrible. It was just awful. It was just like seven people who wanted to play the same game fighting about how we might play the game. And afterwards, I said to someone, uh, you know, have, we, have you ever thought about uh, like facilitating these meetings? And she grabbed my arm and said, T tell me what that is, tell me everything. So I have had some previous experience in some community organizing, just, just using a basic facilitation process of let's set an agenda and take turns, <laughs> right? Like that was the whole idea. But I was able to bring that to the Roller Derby League. And what's really wonderful about being part of something that's so grassroots and that's so young is that I was able to just sort of Essentially, I said, what if we tried this for a meeting, and then two weeks later someone said, do you want to do that for all the meetings, for all the big meetings? It's your job now. You're the league facilitator. Like, and you kind of get to step into a role. And so I had the opportunity in the years that I played roller derby to both tear my ACL and um, become, uh, sort of move into my aptitude for facilitating as much as possible, but also start to build some skills. Eventually I decided I wanted to do something with that um, and I took all my friends out to lunch. It was really exhausting and I kept asking all of them what my gift was because I figured if I could figure out my gift and then go get a master's degree in my gift, whatever I did next I'd be good at and I'd love it. That was my strategy. And um, everyone was like, I don't like this and I don't understand the question. <laughs> so no one had an answer for me. And then sort of the national governing body for roller derby, the Women's Flat Track Derby Association was having a big convening in Milwaukee and they needed someone to facilitate a meeting of the refs. And so um, I ended up getting asked to come do it and I went and I facilitated this meeting with the refs and they were fabulous. We had this incredible meeting, they got everything done on their checklist. It was really fantastic and it was the first time we were really bringing the people that we had asked to um, manage the game into talking about how we designed the game, which was a really big deal, right? Because it's so easy to write the rules for a game that are impossible to call. And so having refs at the table was actually a really inclusive and important step for the sport. So um, I, I got to co-facilitate that. It was a really great experience for me. And afterwards, 
one of the people who'd been in the room was talking to the woman who'd invited me and said, I don't know where you got her, but, and you know, she's really got a gift. And it was like, ba 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 ba, gift, 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 gift. And I was like, this is what I've been waiting for. This is my gift. And um, then I did nothing about it. And I was at a dinner with someone else. And I said, you know, I've been thinking that I want to be a professional facilitator. And I didn't know what that was. And I didn't know that it was a job. And I happened to be speaking to someone who was an attorney. And he said, you should go to law school. And I said, great, I've been looking for direction. And I signed up for the LSAT. Don't do that, that's a terrible plan. You should make a much more thoughtful plan, but it's what happened to me. I sort of was listless. I didn't even know you could get a master's in conflict resolution. There weren't as many at the time, there were a few. And I will say, I think I would have been served really well by getting a master's degree in conflict resolution or peace building or something similar. I think it would have taken me onto strong paths to do a lot of the work that I was able to do. But I'm really glad that I got the JD that I did because it ended up being a really strong tool for me for the community mediation center that I was first a volunteer at and then ended up joining the staff. So I got my law degree at Loyola and in, my, in between my first and second year, I was able to join the volunteer community at CCR, which means that while I was in the last two years of law school, I was meeting these real live cases and getting a lot of real life training from the staff at CCR. And so um, that was you know, really excellent for me. It meant that I didn't end up sort of spending my whole law degree building a skill. I got to also study law classes. When I graduated law school, a position had opened at the organization. I joined the staff and a year later was promoted to programs director. And I had not really thought about it at the time, but I know for sure that when I walked into a judge's chambers with a business card that says JD on the end of it, I get a different reception than I think I would otherwise, right? There is an insularness, right, to that, the legal profession, and I know that having that JD worked really well for me as a tool to open doors. The reason that's really relevant for the work I was doing in Chicago is that the Center for Conflict Resolution was established in 1979. It's one of the country's oldest community mediation centers. And um, when it was established, they, it, I love this story so much. I wasn't there, I wasn't around in 1979, but I love this story that they opened this um, justice, they called it Neighborhood Justice Chicago, which I also love because it sounds like a vigilante group. And they said, you know, if you've got a conflict, you just come on down to Neighborhood Justice and we'll resolve it. And um, that's not how people work. <laughs> so they had just like a handful of cases in the first year because no one, sa no one says, Sarah, I'm so mad at you. Let's go down to Neighborhood Justice and work this out, right? Like that's not what happens when we're in a fight, when we're in a conflict with our neighbor. And so, but, in, but you know, last year, CCR will have done something in the neighborhood of 12 to 1,500 cases, if not more. They got much better at this over the years, and one of the ways they were able to do it was by partnering with the Cook County court system, which is a massive court system. So lots of big cities, like for example, New York City, each of the boroughs has its own court. In Chicago, it's all of Chicago and the suburbs are all one unified court system. It's a lot of people, a lot of cases, and a lot of people who go to court because they have no idea what else to do. I have never met anyone who was like, I met court and I am thrilled to be here. <laughs> I, this is all I wanted to do was sue my friend, right? Like, this is great. You know, people think, I have no, I don't know what else to do. We think of courts as justice centers, as places that are gonna help us resolve a, a conflict. So people go to court. And so CCR, uh, partnered with the courts and I was able um, to help maintain and establish new programs where for the most part people who are showing up for court in, for the first time or coming back to court on something like a parenting plan are able to say are able to see the judge and have the judge say if you haven't had a chance to work this out I'm going to connect you with this third party mediator and then sometimes you're mediating literally the same day on site and then if they settle, it's over. And if they don't settle, they're gonna go see the judge in 30 minutes. And sometimes the court might refer a case and people might come back in two, three, or four weeks and you have more time to work with people. The way that CCR is able to do thousands of cases a year is because they have a pool of uh, nearly 200 certified volunteer mediators. So they train mediators and then support them using their volunteer director and their case management staff. 
And um, after I graduated and joined the staff, I really got a chance to, to support people who were doing the work as well as continue to mediate myself. And very specifically, CCR uses what's called a facilitative mediation model. In mediation, no matter what the model is, we have a series of values that are really central to the work. Self-determination for the parties. So as much as possible, we really don't want the mediator simply making decisions for people. Um, party autonomy, that they're able to show up for themselves. And really inside there too is the idea of voluntariness. Mediation should be a voluntary process. If it stops working for the parties, halfway through, then it stops. That's okay. People, even people who are court ordered to mediation, we still want them to experience um, no pressure to resolve their dispute and no pressure to continue the process if it doesn't work for them. Language that I've used with a lot of folks to explain that is to say, you're free to resolve your dispute however you see fit, right? So you can open a case for mediation and file a court case on the same day. I don't care, right? It's, it's an option, it's a resource. Mediation processes are also confidential. So in Illinois, where I used to work, um, the state of Illinois has the Uniform Mediation Act, which actually does a really great job of clearly spelling out that mediation communications are both confidential and privileged, but even states that don't have the Uniform Mediation Act, mediators and mediation programs really honor this idea of it being confidential. It's, that's especially important because we don't want to, what we don't want to have happen is I create the space for you to have this really productive dialogue. You don't settle the case, you go see the judge, and the judge makes me tell her everything you just said, right? And we don't want that to happen because we want people to be able to show up and be candid inside the mediation conversation. And then of course, neutrality, right? The mediator should not have a sort of a say in the outcome or a belief about what's going to happen or a plan for either of the parties. In a facilitative mediation model, it takes those foundational values and then has a handful of its own. So in a facilitative model, we're gonna get no advice, no opinion, and no assessment from the mediator. My job as a facilitated mediator is to create an opportunity for folks to have a focused and productive dialogue about whatever is happening for them. Most facilitative mediation places, because that's, it's a little rigid, it kind of intentionally, it'll have a pretty specific model that you wanna follow, the order you're gonna sort of get the information and what that's gonna look like. And it's used a lot in community mediation centers. Under a facilitative mediation model, I truly believe that my solution to someone else's conflict is no solution at all. The people who are in the dispute are the ones who are best suited to come up with a resolution that's going to work for them to resolve it. I could settle cases all day with the solutions that are my idea, but guess what? They're gonna breach, they're gonna break the agreement, right? If I say, uh, Sarah, why don't you pay Carl uh, $1,500? She might say, okay, just to get me to leave her alone, but she might not pay it, right? So the idea inside a facilitative mediation model is that we wanna take parties from their um, positional negotiation into interest-based negotiation. So we're getting to the things that are really important to people, ideas of respect, reputation, autonomy, community, and help them build agreements based on those values instead of simply their positions like, I hate you and you're loud, <laughs> right? Like that's a really hard neighbor conversation to say, to talk about. What does it mean to be a good neighbor? Well, we could have a pretty productive conversation about what that might look like. So as a facilitative mediator, I'm gonna ask a lot of questions, sort of summarize for people what I hear happening, acknowledge their emotions, and name their needs and interests to help move the conversation forward. Mediators are supposed to be neutral. Um, and that's true in all of the models, but especially in this one where I'm not gonna even, I'm even neutral to the idea of whether or not they settled. I would rather parties did not settle at all than came to an agreement that didn't work for them or wasn't realistic. I once had a case, um, it was a small claims case in court between two friends and one friend had loaned the other money. This happens a lot. Don't loan your friends money. <laughs> Also, don't buy a condo if you can help it. They're, those end up in court a lot too. But so, um, so, uh, so these these two friends, one had loaned the other friend money, and she had not repaid it. And it was a, a, a I think it's like a, I think it was, let's just say it was two thousand dollars. And so, the judge hands me the, the clerk hands me the file. The judge says, "Go ahead and spend you know some time with them. I'm going to have a conversation with them." 
And I say, you know, we'll, we'll head into this room. And they're like, it's fine. We figured it out. We don't need your help. I'm like, great. My job's going to be so easy. Let's talk about it anyways. I can help you fill out the paperwork. So we go into the room and we sit down. And the one woman says, I owe her $2,000 and I'm just going to pay her back. I said, great. What's the plan? I'm going to pay her $1,000 this month and $1,000 next month. Fantastic. My job as the mediator is to make sure that that's true, that she's gonna be able to do that, that it's not gonna create other hardships for her. Now what else is really important is, I don't care if she was planning to pay her $1,000 a month, $10 a month, or $50,000 a month, I would ask the exact same question. Because if she had $1,000, might she have given it to her before we got to court, right? Like, wouldn't you expect that if, that she's not just like sitting on the cash waiting to get to go to court about it, right? I didn't know you really wanted it back. I was waiting for court. No. So I said to her, great. So you're going to give her $1,000 a month. I'm just wondering, you know, how will that impact your monthly expenses? And it turned out that she, her, it was about half of what she would bring in in any given month. And she was a single parent to multiple children. And so I said, well, are your monthly expenses more than what you will be left with? Now, in this moment, the friend who is owed the money is getting pretty angry, right? Because it feels to her like I'm trying to talk this other friend out of paying her back. But you see, what would happen is if I gave you, if she gives her $1,000 in month one and then doesn't have enough money to pay for everything else in her life, it's very unlikely to make that second payment, right? And so now we're going to end up right back here, right? But this is kind of a rough plan. And so... We end up talking about it, figuring out what would actually work. And in the end, they made a plan that where she was going to pay her over a series of months, which was much more realistic, right, for both of them. It was going to get the woman back all of her money instead of just part of it, even if it took more time. And so, but what's important about all of that is for me the whole time, I do not care as a facilitative mediator if they make a deal. I don't care. They can go see the judge. That's fine. I'm never going to meet them again. I wouldn't recognize them if they were in the room, right? Because I'm invested in creating the space for them to do the work, not in me doing the work for them. So that neutrality extends to not just between the parties, but about the topic that they're talking about as well. In general, I am curious if anyone has any thoughts about what we mean when we talk about being neutral. What does neutral mean? I'd love to, if anyone, yeah, what does neutral mean to you? Not being too opinionated in the side of the conversation. Great. Any other thoughts? I'm repeating it back for the uh, audience. Yeah. Focusing on facts versus feelings. Focusing on facts versus feelings. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah. You know, what's interesting about, I, to I totally understand where you're coming from with that. What's interesting about a facilitative model is I can talk to a person about their feelings, mm -hmm. but what, I, what I'm going to say is, it sounds like I hear you saying that you're really, really mad that she didn't pay you her back and you feel disrespected instead of me saying, if I were you, I'd be mad and I'd feel disrespected, right? So sort of this idea that um, I can name an emotion for someone, but where we lose neutrality is when we sort of say, me too, I am also mad, right? right? Which is how it shows up in emotion. Yeah, that's a great point. Any other thoughts about what we mean when we say neutral? Yeah. Yeah, an impartial third party. That's a great way to put it. And I'm really glad that exactly how we planned it, you used the word impartial. Because the, the, we talk about impartiality a lot when we're talking about the idea of neutrality. And sometimes as a mediator, that serves me really well. I am impartial to what happened. I am on neither of your sides. And sometimes that does not work at all. And for some mediators, they'll learn that that doesn't work at all. It feels too cold. It's really hard to create a space where we're going to have an intimate conversation or a challenging conversation or talk about what's hard or heavy if I'm saying, and I don't really care what happens to either of you. And so a technique that I sometimes will employ for myself and recommend for other mediators is the idea of being bipartial or omnipartial. It's not that I'm on no one's side. I'm on everyone's side. I love everyone, right? So in some ways with those two friends, I don't care what happens. I don't have to pay anybody back any money and no one owes me money, right? But also, I would really like them both to get what they want, which is to manage this financial situation and repair the friendship. And so I can, I'm still neutral as long as that's balanced. If 
I've got a lot of baggage around people owing me money. And I'm really mad at the friend who hasn't paid the money back. Then I then I lost that impartiality, and I you know and I've lost my neutrality. Any other thoughts on that when we talk about neutral? I mean, kind of out of it, I think is how we think about it. And for a long time in my practice, this wasn't this wasn't hard for me. I didn't have a lot of questions about this, and I wasn't confronted very often with this idea of what it means to be neutral once. I had built the skills up and built my mediation practice up. That has changed a lot for me in the last eight years. So I've had a couple of cases that really challenged this idea of what it means to be neutral that um, I'm gonna sort of share with you anecdotally. So um, my father had passed away in October many years ago. And a couple, like a month or so later, I was back at work, I was back in court, I was mediating a case, and the types of cases that I have worked in, you don't get information in advance. So I don't know anything about the parties or the case, I just am gonna try to help them resolve it. I don't even, I don't remember anything about this case, to be honest with you. Because what I remember about the first case is that I'm asking them, you know, what happened, how did we end up here? And the one person says, I know I really should have called you back, but I'm sorry, my dad died. And I went, oh, am I okay, right? Because my dad just died. And I sort of took a minute and I checked in with myself. And if you were here for the last presentation, Sarah Cook was, had this list of all these stress responses that happened to us. And I sort of took a minute to check in, like, do I feel like crying? Am I getting warm? Am I upset? Do, am I, do I have sympathies one way or another for this person? And I didn't. I felt totally fine. I felt completely neutral about it. So I kept going, kept doing the case. A month later, I'm in another case. And someone says, you know, I know I was supposed to be there and I couldn't make it. My mom died. And I almost burst into tears. Right? So it was like, it was so fascinating to me that it wasn't the exact same lived experience that sort of I had an emotional response to, but it was one that was really adjacent. Right? And, it, and, and I don't know if it was the difference between a mom and a dad. I don't know if it was the difference between a Tuesday and a Thursday. Right? Grief moves and changes in us. My grief was in a different place when I did the second case than when I did the first case. And I had to stop. And I said, you know, I'm so sorry, but I can't be, um, I can't be your mediator. I'm, I recently lost a parent and I'm no longer feeling neutral. Cause I was thinking, well, of course she wasn't there. You know, like I had all this and I realized I kind of couldn't move through it and continue to do my job. Because of the circumstances I was working in, what I was able to do was go get another mediator. And I brought the other mediator into the room. I gave them a summary in front of both parties of everything we'd talked about. And then I left, and that mediator was able to finish the case for me. Another time where this showed up for me um, was in, in an interesting way, is that there's a part of the model um, that is sometimes employed, <coughs> excuse me, especially when we're working with co-parents, Right? So these are people who have children together, maybe they were married, maybe not, but they're no longer in romantic partnership with one another, they have to co-parent. And we were using a model, I was using a model that day called Early Caucus, where before I brought the parties together to talk, I was checking in with each one of them privately to check for their stress level, see what they needed, you know, ask them questions about what was happening for them, and really prepare them for what we were about to do. And um, it was a, a, the ex-husband and an ex-wife, a mom and a dad, and I talked to the mom and she was like, look, you're gonna love him, okay? Everybody loves him. But, and she had this litany of problematic things like paperwork that hadn't been filed and all these things that had gone wrong. And she was like, but you're gonna love him. Everybody loves him, my lawyer loves him, the judge loves him, everybody's gonna love him. And I was like, don't worry lady, I don't love anybody. And I went in hard on the impartial thing, right? I was like, I'm neutral, I'm not on anybody's side. If it feels to you like I love him, let's make a code word. I want you to say it, like we'll take a break. That is, don't worry, that's not gonna happen. She was like, okay. I go in the other room, you guys, he was amazing. I mean, I loved him, he was fabulous. I was like, oh no, she was right. He was so charming, I was like, I don't know, maybe you don't need to pay taxes, you seem great. You know what I mean, he just seemed so <laughs> lovely. And I really had to take a break before I brought them together and go talk to someone else and say, can I do this, right? Because here's the risk when it's about the parties like that. Because I did kind of, he was really very charming. I, the risk as a mediator is that you're gonna overcompensate and treat him really poorly. 
right? Because I, so that it doesn't look like I think he's crazy, right? So I worked on some strategy, some strategies, and because I had given the other party like a tool to let me know what happened, and then once we got into the conversation, the charm sort of wore off and I was able to do the case just fine. But it was just so fast, I'd, I'd been mediating for over a decade, I'd never had that experience, but I, I really did. And so, you know, those are ways where it, it showed up for me as a mediator, and sometimes it's small, where you're suddenly unsure if you're still neutral. Um, but sometimes it, it'll stop the whole case. I will say that death of a parent case is one of the only times I've ever had to stop the entire case and I couldn't move forward. But there are cases and projects that I haven't taken because I didn't feel neutral from the onset. Um, so there are a number of different ways that our neutrality can be challenged. The topic, what's being discussed, I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. Um, the people themselves, uh, something that happens uh, a lot for me in parenting cases and when I train people to be co-parenting mediators that we talk about a lot is you better be ready <clears throat> to sit in a room with your own parent or you and your partner or you and a past partner because there are only so many dynamics that we have and every once in a while if you mediate enough cases it, it's like oh my gosh. These are my parents. These are my parents, right? This is this is a dynamic I feel really familiar with, and you've got to be so careful that you don't take your experience and expectations and put that on those other people, um, and really be aware of it. But also sometimes you, it's so easy to see yourself. And parenting cases are some of the most obvious places to where that happens because most of us have had parents or our parents or see romantic relationships. So it's a, a, a dynamic that it's easy to see yourselves in. Sometimes it's the timing of the thing, right? How fascinating to me that the first case about death of a parent didn't, didn't unsettle me, but the second case did. Um, you know, that, that would, had to be something about what was happening for me, and I really needed to honor that for myself. And I also, when it happened the second time, it was important that I was able to take a moment and check in again, instead of saying, well, you did it last time, you can do it this time, it's fine. That changes. My dad's been gone 10 years. I could mediate a case tomorrow and learn, oh, I don't have that in me, right? Like making space for my whole self all the time and letting it change is part of that timing. Also for me is sort of this idea of the intensity. If I'm doing a 50 minute mediation in a landlord tenant case and I don't think the landlord's great, <laughs> I can probably manage that conversation for them, right? We're really gonna be focused on the, you know, the court case that's pending, their relationship, whether or not the person's gonna stay in the unit or move, right? Typically, the, the, the level of intensity for my intervention there is very small. And I think I'm of greater service to that landlord and tenant in making space for them to have their dialogue than I would be if I was like, you know, I really actually need to tell you both about the housing crisis in the United States and how I feel about landlording, right? That's not the place for it, it's not effective, it's not the type of um, interaction, right? So because the intensity of what they need from me as a mediator is very small in an eviction case, it makes a lot of sense to me that, you know, and anything I feel about being a tenant or being a landlord is something that I can leave behind. And then also a huge thing that gets inside of whether or not we're able to keep or maintain neutrality are ideas of our identity. My identities as a person, my identity as a mediator, right? So. So I know, I know mediators, that as soon as they start to feel their neutrality shift, their identity as a mediator is challenged in a way that is really unsettling and they feel like they have to forge ahead. Um, I know that I've had that experience myself. Uh, and I think also all of the other identities that I have and that the parties have can really start to influence how I'm neutral and what neutrality looks like. Um, and that might be shared, shared identity as well as identities that are different from one another. So when I'm talking about identity, just really quickly, what I sort of mean by that is the idea of who I am, right, where I'm from, how does that lived experience influence my work? Should I, as a lifelong tenant, be able to mediate eviction disputes? Probably. If I were a landlord, should I be able to mediate eviction disputes? Probably. If I were uh, writing the legislation about changing landlord-tenant law, Probably not, right? So in what ways um, does, it, does it influence is something that's really important to keep in mind? And how do I make space that I, 
make that space one where the identities and values of others are able to show up. And identity, I know when we talk about it, it can seem like a really fixed list, right? There's the things you can see about me and the things you can't see about me. But I also want to name for you that there are ways in which I think identity is really slippery, right? There are some questions that we might ask someone about identity that feel like they should be easy, that they should be simple, and they aren't. If you asked me how many siblings I have, I would have a hard time answering that. That is not a hard question for a lot of people. Most people know <laughs> or right, have a pretty fixed number. That is not a closed, simple question for me. I am my father's youngest daughter. I am my mother's oldest daughter. I am my parents' only child, right? Am I an older daughter? Am I a younger daughter? Am I a middle daughter, right? And we have this, there's this phenomenon of like birth order identities, right? Older siblings behave this way, middle kids behave this way, the baby siblings behave this way. Which one of those do I fit in if those are like the facts of my birth order, right? And so that's like an identity piece that would show up one way on paper shows up very differently inside my personality. And I didn't meet my older sisters until I was in my 20s, right? So did my birth order change, right? You know, there's these things about it where it seems like so obvious. And I think that's just one example of the ways that are, um, that when we talk about identity, it can be something as simple as what's your birth order, right? Uh, or how many siblings do you have, which can change over time uh, for people. So. One of the most incredible projects I ever had the privilege of being a part of was a project where I was able to be a facilitator for the City of Chicago's Use of Force Working Group. Now the City of Chicago was and is under a consent decree, which is a court order that requires the city and the police department to make a long list of mandatory changes in and around the ways that the police department functions inside the city. There are many American cities that have been and are on consent decrees. Um, that is a totally different <laughs> project and conversation, but one of the projects inside the consent decree was getting feedback on and updating and changing the use of force policy. A lot of work was done on this project before and after I was a part of it. And I don't want a single bit of credit for the labor that was done, because I, I just think it's really important to say that. There are so many people who did so much work about on this project. But for me, it was a huge um, opportunity to think about what it means to be a neutral and what my roles and responsibilities are as a neutral. There's the decisions I made at the time, and I don't know if I would have made the same decisions five years before or five years later, but I want to talk to you about it a little bit. So the Chicago Police Department's Use of Force Working Group was announced, and I just want you all to look at the date there of when it was announced. That is June 15th of 2020. So a lot of work had been done to put the Use of Force Working Group together. The idea was that it was going to bring <laughs> people with lived experience at the hands of the police, as well as higher ranking police officers. Um, we had, there was an alderman. There's a very public list of who was on, it's actually later in this article. <laughs> there's a public list of who was on the working group. Um, there's a lot of moving pieces to this because it's inside a piece of the consent decree, but it also involved people who were not members of the court case. And, um, the city had hired a consultant to work on the project and the consultant needed to find a facilitator. Now I had previously met with the consultant because I was hoping that the agency I was working for would be able to be a resource for another part of the consent decree, which was creating a community police mediation program. And so, um, the, the consultant knew that my agency existed, knew that my executive director and I existed, and she reached out to see if we wanted to facilitate this use of force working group. And my organization, my executive director, and my board were very generous with my time, and they allowed me to spend the time for months to meet weekly on Zoom in the summer of 2020 with nearly 30 people to talk about police and police violence and the experience 
experience of what it is to be policed in the city of Chicago. These conversations were incredible and unfortunately, due to the amount of labor that the group really had to do because they were going through you know, a, a, every piece of the, um, of the policy, there was not a lot of space for the work that Sarah Cook was talking about earlier for the storytelling. Right? So people's stories would, would come in and they were certainly influential in how um, the group talked about their work, but we, we just didn't have the luxury of everyone telling their stories, which I think would have been um, just an experience that I wish could have been facilitated for them. Uh, they made a lot of recommendations to the Chicago Police Department, and initially the police department, uh, the city accepted, I think, nearly none of them, if not none of none, a few, but none of the, the truly substantial ones. My official work ended with the committee in the summer of 2020, um, but I want to lift up that that group kept working, and the uh, judge who runs the consent decree and the coalition kept working, and in the end, they were able to put together some very um, substantive changes to the policy, uh, including that the policy now requires de-escalation um, and a restriction to police violence, um, a restriction of Chicago Police Department forces at protests. It changed the requirements to report for when officers use force, and it created restrictions on less lethal weapons and dogs. And um, throughout the, the new policy, there was an idea of promoting accountability and transparency after there were shootings or killings of community members at the hands of police officers. I was not part of making the, the final stages of the work happening, but I think it's just really important to lift up all the outcomes and the labor. There's a really beautiful report on the University of Chicago's website where you can read all about the work that they were able to accomplish and all of the unmet needs and further recommendations. What I wanna lift up for you about this it was really challenging for me is I am a person and I am alive and I don't feel neutral about policing. And no matter how you feel about policing, it's unlikely to be like, I'm sure it's fine, nothing, right? And especially not in the summer of 2020. And I was really struggling when I was appointed to, to, to facilitate this working group. I was really, really struggling with whether or not it was something that I wanted to do. And I wasn't sure that it was my work to do, that it was appropriate for me to do it. Um, I don't have a lived experience with policing uh, as a police officer or at the hands of police that I thought, you know, I didn't, I didn't have any lived experience to bring to the conversation. And I thought, oh, should I have lived experience? And I started reaching out to my mentors and colleagues to get advice and recommendations. Um, and a mentor of mine, uh, D.G. Mon at the National Association for Community Mediation, he gave me such beautiful perspective. And he said, look, if you think you could do more for this work somewhere else, then quit. <laughs> like, it hasn't started. They're not paying you. There isn't a contract. You know, you, then don't do it. They will find someone else. They will figure out someone else to do this work. If you think that you could exact change better or have what you want to have happen better somewhere else, then don't take this project on. Because I was saying, oh, I don't think I can be the facilitator and support these efforts in these other ways. And he was like, you certainly can. So then just don't do the facilitation and do this other thing. And when confronted with those two options, I went, oh no, that clearly this is a place where I felt I could do the most work. And so for me, where I thought I could really bring a lot of value um, is that because I didn't have that lived experience, I was thinking I could really do a good job of making the space for people to make sure that the voices of people who needed to be at the table, who should really be at the table, could be there without having a facilitator have to sacrifice themselves into it, right? I don't know if that was the right choice. I think there are practitioners and facilitators and other people who would say, no, you shouldn't have done it because you didn't have um, that lived experience. Someone else probably maybe should have done it. And I, I don't know that it was the right choice, but for me at the time, it felt like the way that I could contribute the most of what I had to the work. But it was really challenging for me because I, I don't feel neutral about policing. But when I thought about it and realized, yeah, but I'm very good at being neutral. I'm very good at making space 
for other people to have a conversation. It felt to me like the way to, to move forward, and I, I kept people in. And so I think neutrality, it can change um, over time. I might feel completely differently about this case, about that group, um, about my work in a decade than I do now. Um, and again, I don't know how I would have handled it um, when I was younger, and also the world has changed so much, right? What it, what it looks like, um, and I think, you know, some of the other speakers throughout today have been talking about that, you know, where things are polarizing inside the classroom, inside the family, inside um, the grocery store line, <laughs> right? That like we can think that people are revealing a lot of how they feel and what they think when they tell us one of their identity markers. In the last presentation, Sarah was talking about some of the, the stress responses that we have and how our uh, nervous system is activated, uh, just sometimes, not just, not simply, but inside a story, inside a conversation, right? That we have the same sort of stress response we would if a bear walked into the room. And I think that one of the reasons that that is happening for us is because Sometimes what we are hearing from someone is a threat not to our physical body, but to our identity, or a perceived threat to those identities and to those values in a way that the only way I know to respond is the same way I would if a bear walked into the auditorium, right? And so um, those, those pieces and knowing about that, those models and knowing when to look for those stress responses, and for me knowing when to look for my limitations in and around bias and neutrality really help me when deciding what kind of cases to take. So I think it's really important to consider when taking all cases and all projects, if I'm able to maintain the neutrality that's required for this dialogue. Again, if I have a big opinion about a thing and it's a 60 minute case, maybe I can help these people, um, but, but maybe I can't. How might my beliefs, thoughts, identities, or values impact this conversation? And also, do I have the skills to support the work? And then I think that it's also important to recognize whether or not there are others who can take the project, right? Are there others who can take this project on? And um, work that I'm really working on right now is expanding my network to be a resource. When, if I'm invited to do a project and I know that I'm not the fit or I think I might not be the best fit, whether that's around neutrality, identity, or something else, how do I make sure that I've got a vast network so that I can make myself a, a resource and get someone who might be better suited, who might have the skills I'm missing, who might have an experience I'm missing, to either come in and work with me and teach me or take the project, take the case, take the mediation. And, and then I think there's also a really big important question of who should do the work of polarizing conversations. Um, is it ideal to have people who have opinions about the topic serve to facilitate the conversation because they can help guide it and make sure that things don't get missed? Or is it a disservice to the experience of those people to ask them to sort of put it down and put it away and instead show up as a neutral? I have no idea what the answer is to that. And honestly, I think probably it's sometimes one and sometimes the other. Um, but I do think it's a really important piece of the conversation when we think about what conflict resolution looks like, um, what mediation looks like, and how we move through polarizing conversations. And then one last note that I want to lift up here is the ideas of care. Uh, when we talk about healing-centered spaces, trauma-led spaces, when we talk about making sure that people aren't moving into distress and unable to participate productively in a dialogue, and we want to make sure that people can show up effectively inside a healing conversation. Those values are not limited to the participants of a dialogue. That is true for the mediator as well, for the professional neutral. And as a profession, I think that we have a lot of opportunity to grow that talent for ourselves, as, as professionals and for other professionals. It's really easy for mediators and facilitators and peacemakers to end up actually practicing in a lot of isolation and sort of carrying around the work of our cases on our own. I often say that um, there are a handful of cases I've had in my life that just got stuck in my belly and I'm still carrying that story 
around with me, that person I met, that conflict. Um, we often experience emotional contagion and sometimes secondary trauma from holding space for people that are in distress. We've all had that experience where someone who's in a terrible mood walks into a room and sucks all the joy out, right? You know, and when you sit in space with people for hours and listen to them tell their stories and help them think critically about what's happening for them, you know, you're really deeply engaged and it can have an impact on you. And so one of the things that I'm really hoping for the profession is we're looking at who should be doing this work is also a question of how should we be doing this work and making sure that we're taking care of everyone in the space, and that includes the person who's responsible for building the space. We have some time reserved now for questions and further discussion. And this gorgeous slide that's supposed to be some part of Utah. I don't know. That's what the internet said. So, um, yeah, so that's everything that I had prepared, but I am really happy to take your questions. They have a microphone for you. Sorry to point at you. I, yeah. um, I was just wondering if you have ever worked on a case where the parties weren't moving closer towards a resolution, and if so, what does that kind of look like, and what is the role of a mediator in those circumstances? Absolutely, yes. In a facilitative model, we would hope for about half our cases to settle when we approve. So m many, many cases do. The first, one of the really critical things is to not be upset about it, right? That it isn't going to settle, especially if it seems obvious to you as a mediator how it could settle, right? If the partner's not coming up with that, that deal, that plan, that isn't going to work for them. Um, you know, what the, some of the techniques that I like to do is remind people that there is nothing particularly magic about the space that we're in. And, that, um, and make sure that if there are any offers on the table, confirm from the parties that those offers are still on the table, right? So let's say you're gonna, you know, like, I know you said that you were willing to pay 500 and that you couldn't accept less than 1,000. I just wanna make sure those offers still on the table if anything were to change for the two of you moving forward. So you wanna make sure that, because sometimes people are like, no, it's now, take it or <laughs> leave it, right? And that's actually really important data to have. And then it's also helpful to, um, you can help sort of refocus the parties by talking about what's going to happen next. So if there's a court case, we talk about what's gonna happen next, make sure everyone knows when's the next court date, where is it, what time is it. Another thing that I'll do is say, you know, it looks like we're out of time for today or it sounds like you've both said everything you needed to say today. What I want to do though is make sure if you two wanted to carry this conversation on with one another, does that work for everybody? And then you make sure they've got good contact for each other. I cannot tell you at least three times, a whole case has been solved in that moment because someone had the wrong phone number for someone else, right? And like where people are fighting about, like I called you, I called you, I never heard from you, you're a liar, you're a liar. And then I'm like, what phone number were you calling? And it's like, oh, that six is an eight, you know? And it's like, oops, now everyone's embarrassed, right? And we can, uh, so, want to make sure that if they're if it's if they're both comfortable continuing the dialogue that they have the resources to do so and that if they're not they both know this is going to actually be the end of shared dialogue and we either don't know what's going to happen or we know what is going to happen i was a party to a mediation once and i i i wish i remembered this mediator's name because i've stolen this so many times but one of the mediators said at, in his opening statement he said today will be an opportunity to see if we can figure out a way that you're going to move forward either together or as individuals. And I love the idea that one of the things that people get from being in mediation, even if you don't resolve it, is you have a clearer sense of what's happening. You know whether or not the offer you're being given is one you can handle. And you have a sense of how you're gonna move forward. I've had people in really challenging neighbor cases say, I think I'm gonna just have to move. And like that's not a resolution, but it surely is a, a, a way to move forward. So those are some of the, the best ways to do it, as much as you can keep them in continued dialogue. I had a case once where someone else was mediating it. I was supporting the mediator as the case manager, and he'd actually been out of practice for a while, and he'd come back and recertify. It was his first case back. He was so excited, and they didn't settle. And I was like, you know, that's not a problem. And he was like, yeah, but I just really wanted them to settle, you know. And then someone knocked on the door and said, the parties are back. And we were like, uh oh. 
and they and then we we went out and they were like we have a deal so they both ended up getting in the same elevator <laughs> and they were sitting riding in the elevator together and one was like will you take five grand and the other was like yeah and they got to the ground floor and they hit the button they came right back up and we wrote up the agreement <laughs> so i say that because it's also really helpful to remember as mediators that sometimes people cannot make a deal right now they cannot resolve it right now they need time especially if the mediation led you to new information so really making sure that that path is still open, that the communication is still open, that people can come back to me as a mediator or not, like making sure that's still open. Because sometimes people resolve it the, you know, the next day, the next hour, in the elevator. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm curious about um, whether or not the cost for mediation ends up playing a role whether or not it puts uh, you know, stress on the mediation itself and whether the uh, yeah. um, end up calling it a waste of time or money. Yeah, that is a fantastic question. And honestly, I let's do a whole new tech. I'm going to take the next hour. We're going to talk about paying mediators because it's a whole other, sorry, Carl. No, it's a whole other thing. So, no, so, um, so at most community mediation centers, it, mediation is free or low cost. So where I worked, it was free to everyone. Regardless, no inquiry on income, geography, nothing. So anybody could call, get a free mediation, which is incredible when it comes to access and incredible for devaluing a profession, right? You can't give it away. I'm like, please come, it's free. You just have to come for an hour. People are like, nope. And sometimes people will say, say well, if it's free, it must not be very good. So I know that's not exactly what you're asking, but it's sort of on the other side of trying to get community mediation out to people getting free and low cost mediation out to people is it's also really easy to accidentally undervalue the work of the mediator and the experience itself. For professional private mediators, if you were bringing me a case, we figure out who's paying me and how much I'm being paid before the conversation begins. That's the, a typical process. You, you, settle, you settle that because I'm, we're not going to spend two hours fighting about whether or not you're going to pay the mediator. So that gets resolved on the front end. There are also mediations that end up in, uh, with the cases that end up with a mediator, either as a creature of statute or because it's something that we already agreed to in the contract. Typically, a mediation clause or something that's in um, that's in a public policy is going to have a delineation of who, whether it's a split cost or the initiator pays or something like that. Mm -hmm. The the a question around it might come up, and what I what I have seen a lot in my career is um, court-based free mediation, one of the big things that the parties argue about is the court fees that they have to pay to be a court. So um, it's different in different jurisdictions, but it is not uncommon that to file a court case, you pay a filing fee. And then once you get sued, you pay a fee to get sued. So you pay a fee to access the court to be able to defend yourself once there's good service. The plaintiff almost never knows that the respondent has also had to file a fee. That feels really strange to people. I'll be honest, I don't know what it is here in this jurisdiction, but you know, often plaintiffs, and as a mediator, the way I use that, right, is someone will say, well, I want my filing fee back. And then I pretend like I've never heard of it. I'm like, you paid a filing fee? What? And then I turn to the other party, I'm like, did you have to pay to come to court? And they're like, I'm like, whoa. And then what you do is a great mediator trick where you just make them both hate somebody else. So in that instance, you're like, oh, the court's terrible, right? You know, we've got common ground, we're both mad at the court, and usually people kind of call it even. They've got a, they've got a mic coming around for the two of you. Um, what strategies would you have um, for keeping neutrality with the option of like um, uh, withdrawing from the mediator position isn't Yeah, I, I think if your neutrality is challenged deeply enough, it really sh always should be. You, you should be, able, even, even if someone was paying me a lot of money and had brought me out and I was mediating a case, I, I would still want to make sure that I had something, some sort of structure in place because I think it's too, I think it's unethical to continue on a case when your neutrality is challenged in a way that, that you can no longer serve the parties. I don't know exactly what that looks like. It might be like having that network, having other mediators you could call in. 
It might mean that you don't pay so have someone pay to travel. You you fly you across the country instead. You do it virtually in case it doesn't work. Um, if you have concerns about your neutrality, you can get in front of that with really thorough and intentional intake with both of the parties. As long as you meet with one party privately, you can meet with the other party privately. So that can help sort of manage those things. Again, I was really privileged that I was in a circumstance where there was literally somebody waiting in the hall that could take over the case. But I think um, preventative strategies would, are, are critical. Um, and I can't really imagine a circumstance where you would be, look, they'll be mad. Like, they'll be mad at you. <laughs> but as soon as you tell them that you, what's happening, they're, you know, they're likely to um, be as understanding as possible to, to move forward. There was another question down at the end. Um, I've heard stories of like there being, I guess, like paraprofessional like mediators out there. Like, how do you figure out who's like really doing it and who's mm -hmm. just kind of almost scam like? Paraprofessional is a new word for me, and I love it. <laughs> um, that's fantastic. So, you know, when I went to law school. I was like, I want to be a mediator. And I met people who were, I met all these people who were mediators. I was doing all this really intentional networking. And all of them said the same thing to me. That is not a job. Which was really upsetting and really unsettling to hear. And it's a message that the profession has given for a very long time. Now, in some ways it's true. I don't know, I really don't know many people who have a job where you clock in at nine and you clock out at five and all you do all day is mediate. Frankly, I think that would be really bad for you. It's a really, really hard job. But I think that um, people add mediation to a cohort of other skills, ho hopefully. Um, and I think that honestly, it means that they are better suited for certain types of cases. So I think if I, was, if I were looking for a mediator for a case, I would be looking for someone with a certain amount of experience, but not necessarily, you know, 30 years of experience and a 98% settlement rate sounds amazing. I would be really skeptical of that, right? I think it depends on the type of case you're doing. If we're trying to like work out a business deal, it's a corporate affair, neither of us is invested at all, it's a commercial transaction. In fact, I'm not even gonna be there. I'm gonna send my lawyer's lawyer. Like, you know, I want somebody who's gonna get the deal done. But if it's you and me and we're neighbors, Right? I actually really want someone who has a background that looks like mine, or maybe even a transformative mediation background, who's gonna really be able to make space for us as people, as humans, as neighbors, and help us resolve like a breadth of what might be happening for us. So one of the other problems of the profession that leads to what you're talking about is that it is, it is really easy to take a class and say that this is a thing you do, and it is really challenging to get opportunities. And so um, community mediation centers and mediation programs can be a really great way to, for, pe for people who wanna become mediators to start to get to do the work, um, which is, unfortunately often means volunteering. Uh, Sarah and I were talking to someone yesterday and she was like, I recommend you volunteer. And I was like, volunteer as little as possible, get your money, you know, don't, don't get it all away. But I, I don't know a lot of mediators that didn't start in either well-established in a career and they added mediation or doing volunteer work um, or you know an apprenticeship or something like that with another mediator. I think there are good questions about what you might be looking for in a mediator or what a client or someone that you're trying to help access mediation might need, but I think they're really, really case specific. There are very few things that I would point to and say, never a mediator with this, which is not a specific Yeah. And she was in charge of finding the mediator, and I guess she got someone that didn't have the credentials. So then the judge looked at it and he's like, "Yeah, you, this isn't going to work. You're going to need to like pay and uh, get the real thing." I'll say I think it's amazing that the judge bothered to look. Like that's actually a, like that's a success story for me that the judge <laughs> bothered to look but and then was it ended able up to costing look. more money. So all that money she had spent Certainly. on the person that was supposed to be good. Yeah, there are. Um, there are usually rules about who can do family mediations in particular. A lot of districts want people to have either family experience or um, family law experience. 
a lot of bar associations and courts will keep rosters of trained attorneys or trained attorney mediators, which is sometimes a good way to go. And then honestly, you can't be word of mouth, right? Like getting a me like hiring a mediator because someone you know use them as a mediator is really the be one of the best ways to find someone. I think. Yeah, I'm so sorry about your friend. Yeah, there's a lot of good mediators out there too. Yeah. Any other questions? We have just like a few more minutes left. Okay. I think we'll go ahead and wrap. Thank you all so much for your time. It was really a pleasure to be here. The next speaker is at 2.30? 2.30, yeah. 2.30? Okay, so we'll see you back at 2.30. Hope you're able to join us.